What is this, CJ? Is this our second installment of Arthur Third? Second, right? It's the second, yes. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to start saying this at the beginning of every podcast now. Uh, there will be a Noetic app soon. And, you know, uh, we love making content like this. We want to make more of it. We want to improve the quality of it. If you would like to help us with those goals, just hit the blue button on your app and donate to us, whatever you can afford. It'd be cool. Help a guy out. Anyhow. Uh, so uh, we're jumping back into our conversations about uh, Roland Barr's uh, camera lucida and photography. Um, I don't know. I went back and I listened to what we did last week. Thought we did a pretty solid job. What did you think? I thought we did well as well. Yeah. Was I'm... there anything that you wanted to bring up or anything that surprised you that you looked back on and said, oh, that's really interesting. I should dig into that more. Do you have anything or... I actually don't have a lot of notes. I mean, I, 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 it, all I can really say is that it's um, refocusing my attention on image again. I was, I, I, and I mentioned this in the the podcast I did with Jordan earlier this week. Um, I've been listening to David Foster Wallace's uh, uh, Infinite Jest on on audiobook, and he, there's a long um, discussion of the role that video telephony plays in the culture. You're going to explain the telephony. It, well, it, essentially, it's FaceTime, mm. and and. Uh, Oh, a B. Um, <laughs> essentially, it's FaceTime. And, and, I mean, he was anticipating how individuals would not... In, like, people would theorize that this... When, at the time that he was writing this, he, he was kind of creating the sci-fi scenario that one day in the not-too-distant future, we would have video phones. And, and people in this book are, like, really ginned up and excited about it. But then it turns out that people reject the video phones and go back to just the oral sort of talking to one another. Mm. And there's something about having their image distilled on the video phone that everybody hates. So much so that cottage industries creep, creep up that involve people wearing masks to um, hide their flawed selves and project an ideal self onto oh, the medium of no. video telephony. That plays so well into what we're going to be talking yeah, about yeah, today. Yeah. And I think that's so fascinating, at least with sci-fi. I mean, I know some people discount sci-fi and say, oh, it's just a kid's genre or it's just genre fiction or whatever. But I think I think the idea of having a projected ideal, like, okay, this is what's going to happen in the future, just kind of making a prediction, but then having the ramifications of that kind of be explored, at least in the novel, whether it be moral, aesthetic, yeah, social, is really fascinating. Well, and obviously, Wallace does that. Yeah, I think it was really great. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was really great because last week we were talking about what I really love about what we're doing, like we're just making this like think tank on the farm, right? Like what I love about that is that, uh, well, you can hear the cow, but <laughs> what I love about this is that we have sort of um, a perspective outside of traditional academic settings that allow us to innovate. And you know, I think last time we were talking about, you know, what is the future of philosophy and where, where can we go? I mean, David Foster Wallace in Infinite Jest is musing about the philosophical ramifications of an invention that hasn't come to exist yet. He's hi he's um, hypothesizing that it will come to exist. And now that we do have FaceTime and iPhones and Skype and things like that, we could really do what Barth has done with photography just on FaceTime and, and Skype. Like, I could write a whole book about that, and that would be a legitimate philosophical work, but I don't know if I would have reached that conclusion had I not done philosophy outside of the traditional academic circle. Mm. Yeah. But I mean, there's probably there's there's treasure troves of philosophical insight into something like that. Uh, it's just waiting there for somebody to to, to exhume it. Oh, yeah, I mean, anything that we take for granted, especially today with all this technology. I mean, any all everything is loaded. I think that's the wonderful thing. Yeah, we said that last time. I think we're learning time, from Barth that everything is loaded with information and potential discovery and pondering so yeah but let's let's ponder yeah, let, the photograph yeah let's jump right into it so today we're going to cover uh chapters 12 through 21 um and hope that we're not interrupted by nature too much during the course of this conversation and we'll give nature a couple <sighs> we'll let minutes. her chime yeah, yeah we'll give her a couple seconds we'll let her chime in here and there maybe she'll have something nice to say yeah we've had a bee and a cow so far <laughs> right <laughs> and there's some nice birds in the background all right so um he starts off uh, talking about um, the distinctions between painting and photography. Yes. Um, first of all, what he has to say is that um, there's something that, a, that a, what a camera can do that a painting cannot do, right? Yeah. So a painting, people tend to think that 
photography is very closely related to painting. Especially with portraiture. Just, okay, yeah. well, you're just drawing Lincoln right. and take a picture of Lincoln. What's the difference? Well, the thing is, with, like, we, with portraiture, there's there's things that we can include and not include, right? There are things that we can omit, right? And, and what he thinks that's one of the, the wonderful virtues of photography and its act of mimesis is that there is no detail that can escape the camera lens. So what he thinks is that there's going to be, if we're looking at photos from 100 years ago or people looking at photos of us from 100 years now, we may totally look over a lot of the information that's in those things. But from an ethnographical perspective, it's just going to be loaded with so many details that the people at that time took for granted, overlooked, whatever. Mm. But to us, will tell us something incredible about the culture at that time. So I thought that was a pretty interesting thing. Like, it, it may, I don't know. Like, let, let's experiment right now, right? Like, so, okay. so I wonder if there's anything culturally significant. For those watching this on, on YouTube, is, I wonder if there's anything culturally significant. About us? Well, look at that. You have a logo. What does that mean? I am. Is that, is that a crest? Is that a family crest? Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's a brand. Yeah. What's I don't, a brand, right? Yeah. I mean, what, what does a brand mean? I am, in, I am subconsciously yeah. repping Nike. And so are you right. with Columbia Nautica. Did you think... Yeah. Until you pointed it out on my on my on my uh, hoodie here, I didn't. If you had asked me what's on my hoodie, I'd say nothing. Yes, I am. Oh, so, so, so we are yeah. living in we are living in the age of uh, unconscious advertising and branding of ourselves. I never think about the things that I'm representing. No, and maybe we don't really think of that. But sometimes, though, I mean, there's that feeling too. I mean, especially because we're recording on a Apple computer, that some things are worth being represented. Or at least we want to say, yes, that's that's me. I'm an Apple computer. I represent everything an Apple computer does. But maybe there are some things that you don't really care as much where maybe clothing might not be. Well, clothing for some people is a big deal. But other people, too, are just saying, well, I, I, I'd rather just get any kind of computer. Honestly, I don't care what a computer projects about me or anything. I, you know, my, mine's a hand-me-down Apple, so I don't know. I don't feel so braggadocious. Oh, well, about whoever it. had it, whoever had it the first time, maybe bought it because there was some kind of connection, or maybe, yeah, maybe it was purely a mercantile sort of thing where they just said, "Well, it's the cheapest thing I can get, I'm gonna buy it." And maybe that's the the idea, or maybe that's the um, certain thing that just you looking at this, looking at you with your logo, maybe just makes people think about too. Maybe. So, yeah. I don't know. I guess people are going to go out. I guess Nike is going to experience a massive <laughs> uptick in their stock <laughs> because I'm wearing their hoodie. <laughs> yeah, man, man. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I'd, I'd like to give a philosophical endorsement of Nike. <laughs> That'd be wonderful. Um, <laughs> Anyways. Do it? Question mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just, do just it. have a question mark on just it. Just do it. So going into chapter thirteen, um, he he talks a little bit more about the distinctions between painting and photography. Yeah, so we're and, gonna get the big distinction. Well, yeah, and I thought this was absolutely insane, and I want <laughs> I, I want to know what you actually if you actually think that it's a credible distinction, okay. right? Like the idea essentially being that that painting and portrait painting and photography are really not that close together. He says. He says. If photography is close to any other art form, what does he say it is? Well, I guess he says it's theater. Yeah, he says and what theater. for you? What for you confounds that idea? I guess maybe if you go into further detail, we we'll have to develop it a little bit. I mean, so I guess we have to say first of all, why does he think that photography and theater bear some semblance? Right? Well, do you want to say, or do you well, want me to say? Well, we can say it together. I, I suppose it's death. It's so, death, yeah, yeah. right? Right. Death so, so, sure. so, what is it? So. What does that even mean? What does it mean that there's death in photography and there's death in, in theater? Well, we've talked a little bit about death in photography. How have we talked about death in photography? Well, we talked about it in the sense that there is, when you take a picture, that person, or if you, if I took a picture of you, that person that you were at that moment is gone. Is gone. You can't take it back. So it's, then, with theater, what's the well, the connection with theater, the connection he says then. that theater arose out of an imitation of dead people. That people would wear masks of people who are long since past and act out their lives. So, the, so an actor is sort of this um, animating mechanism underneath this shell of a thing. So it's both alive and dead at the same time. And a, photo and a photograph is the same way in a sense because it is it is a moment of my being, right? A picture of Luke Johnson... Um, 
that moment of my being is forever gone, right? I'm even older than I was before. I'm older now, older now. It's gone. It's 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 back in the re- God's receptacle of memory or wherever we mm-hmm. want to say it is, or maybe there's no past or whatever. But but at this so so a photograph at the same f- freezes an instant mm-hmm. that is is long dead at the same time. It has a vivacity, but dead simultaneously. And the actor who wears a mask is both alive and and dead. But I, I, I don't I'm confused, know. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested why you find that confounding. Because it doesn't seem like they're the same kind of marriage of, of alive and dead, right? It's like, like, like I, the actor is kind of like this, this duality of like, I don't know. It's like the weekend at Bernie's or something like that, where like, you're kind of moving this corpse in order to convince everybody that he's still alive. Mm-hmm. Whereas the photo is, it seems to be do something entirely different. There's not like a, a, a life force underneath it. it but isn't it not convincing trying to convince you didn't we talk about that last time how sometimes photographers try to convince at least the spectator that the image is alive or full of life in some way as well yeah 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 i mean i guess i i guess i wonder it's an interesting point to bring out i think hmm. it bring i perhaps I, if we use an example say take like a like Shakespeare's Julius Caesar or something like that, where historical figures are portrayed by people, whether that be today or in Shakespeare's time. Is that, is that in some way, is there maybe just too much, maybe not so much mimesis, where it's not, it's not exactly like they're taking Shakespeare, I mean, they're not exactly taking Julius Caesar and saying, this is exactly what happened to him. Blah, 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 but maybe it's a little bit of, uh, what do you call it, poesis, I guess if we're using the Greek term, where they kind of give you an, a vague idea of what it's, so there is like the mimesis is there, it's Julius Caesar, but it's not really Julius Caesar because there are all these other different elements, and maybe with photography, like, that's a photograph of Luke Johnson, but it's not really Luke Johnson because mm. there are certain little elements that maybe give it away that he's not who he was or you can attach you can you can you can attach all sorts if it's an unflattering photograph you're going to attach all sorts of meanings to it that don't that don't really represent what i am and we'll talk a little bit more about that in regards to masks or whatever sure. yeah this idea of masks are not going away i guess what i felt like i felt like it was an interesting parallel and but i wonder if it's a substantive distinction because all right, like a painting right mm-hmm. couldn't you say that a painting is both alive and dead in a way like i mean it's a dead artifact but it does it does have a ref an idealized referent or i mean doesn't it give some sort of aren't haven't you seen some paintings that are just so lifelike and so almost photographic i guess i'm just sure or maybe 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 emphasis on that is lifelike it, it wasn't actually yeah. life where yeah. i mean i think yeah at least at the end of that little section on comparing it to theater he did say that photography in a sense was a crude form of theater I believe he used the term tableau vivant, something of that nature. Mm -hmm. So perhaps theater is with people. I mean, the form is the human being or the the subject is a live human being. And perhaps on a different plane than photography, he's acting out another person's life that already happened and that you kind of realize, like, this isn't really Julius Caesar, but it is at the mm. same time. Or maybe maybe that's where the distinguishing part comes in, where, like in photography, how, like I said, I take a picture of you, and it is you, but it's not you at the same time. There's that kind of death. Mm-hmm. Maybe with a depiction of a play of a historical figure, would that be, you know, emperors and lords in, like, no theater or or of Julius Caesar and Shakespeare, that it is that person or it is that figure, but at the same time it's not. And maybe that's that's the distinction that he's trying to find, that death is that where you, I mean, it is your corpse, but you're not alive, you're yeah. dead. I just, if I were to create yeah. a Venn diagram, of, <laughs> if I were to create a Venn diagram of theater, painting, and, 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 and photography, mm-hmm. I just don't know if it if I could say at the uh, after creating that Venn diagram if photography is definitively closer to theater than than to painting. I I, sure. I, I think there's going to be some overlap between painting and photography that isn't shared with theater, and it makes it kind of a wash. I do agree that they're all sort of connected. I think it's interesting, but I just don't know if it's. I, it might be a bridge too far to say that 
for certain that that photography is closer to painting. It doesn't really matter because oh, these are artificial distinctions that don't really matter in the first does. place. It does. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But at the same time, though, I think it is fascinating, especially what you brought up about these bridges. That I think all of the thinkers that at least we have done for podcasts, they've all had some kind of distinctions between the arts. And that might be something worth looking into. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and yeah. other art and other philosophers and thinkers it, as well. There, are, there are these. I mean, even though we say we can't say, we can say for sure, like, okay, these are artificial. They're still there. No. And they're still very present. So perhaps that's maybe another topic to go in, whether well, it be us or somebody else. Well, I guess of, we could we could speculate. We could speculate on Nietzsche if Nietzsche thought so highly of tragedy. Mm-hmm. as being the like, sort of supreme art form in theater. It'd be interesting. Nietzsche might be very sympathetic to photography had he ever experienced it, really. Yeah. Although I do think there are some images of... Oh, he was I, photographed. He was photographed. I don't know if he was... Oh, he was still sane when he got photographed. Because yes. there's some pictures of young Nietzsche. There's that young Nietzsche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's young Nietzsche stuff. No, I'm curious, there. though, maybe if we have any accounts. Whether I mean, probably not in philosophical texts of his, but perhaps letters or anything like that regarding technology in that field i don't know yeah i mean there is an interesting bit i don't remember where i read this but it was nietzsche he's talking about writing writing his philosophical text and how he changed to this sort of typewriter thing it's odd he described it as a sphere it's almost like this typewriting sphere thing where you just kind of like type da 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 was it like a was it like a proto typewriter that he had? something like that yeah hmm. and and I remember at least in an account I don't know if it was I think it was a letter or he was talking to somebody he says yeah it's it's very fascinating that the way I present my ideas are different than when I wrote them shorthand oh, than most when definitely. I wrote in on this little typewriter oh thing. yeah the way so, I present philosophical ideas yeah. on video is totally different than I would in a paper. Yeah, right. It's totally so I mean, different. so I mean, there is that interesting distinction between how I mean how technology, especially I mean when you talk about photography, which is based on technology, how that can change an art form in some way, or you know we can't really say it's like painting, and maybe like you're saying, maybe we can't really say it's like theater. It 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 does something different, almost like how Nietzsche says, like I'm not writing the same thing as I did with the typewriter. Like we're not doing the same thing as we did with painting or with theater. And perhaps, I think, I think we can go further into that. I think Barth does, at least. Yeah, uh, I, yeah I, 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 I don't... I, I'm kind of, I've kind of said all that I've got on the connection between theater and, 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 and photography. I, I, I'm sort of ready to move on to the types of surprise that are involved in photography. Surprise me. All right, we all right. Well, so, so in Chapter 14, uh, the... The uh, uh, Barth talks that there are five different ways that a photographer can surprise us. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I, I, I've I've gone and enumerated them here. Maybe we'll just go one by one I, and, and sort of explicate them for people. Sure. Yeah. So so the way that a photographer can surprise us in in the first case would be if an if they were able to capture a rare image, the a, a rarity photo, right? And so what does he mean by a rare image? I use the example of a two headed boy. In my sure. in my lecture or something like that. like a freak an oddity something that you don't see every day and it's like that'll cause you to sort of gasp yes right and so that, that's perfect I is think. that is that uncontroversial to no, you I, uh, I, don't know. Uh, I don't know how uh, yeah. controversial no I think that's perfect I shouldn't say two headed boy because you have two heads you're really two boys well, you're you, Siamese you're yeah you're you're Siamese which is yeah. in some sense an oddity but yeah I don't know I'm down with it I, I ain't gonna hate on Siamese twins. Neither am I. Ain't odd to me. Um, so what's the second? The second is that a, a photo uh, that that captures an instance in a rapidly unfolding act. Okay. So this is is this is the example Barth used with the milk? Image? No, that's oh. the next one. Oh, okay. Oh. Uh, so so for this this one is uh like if you were to f- like I use an example of photographing something that was historically significant. So I when he, when he was talking about this, I it conjured up in the, the image in my mind because I used to have a T-shirt of I mean, this sounds really macabre but I used to have a t-shirt of when Jack Ruby shot um, Lee Harvey Oswald oh, wow. uh, it was like but in this t-shirt I there'd been enough distance from this photograph the gun that Jack Ruby had been used to shoot Lee Harvey Oswald had been replaced with a guitar 
and Oswald, because he's recoiling from being shot in the stomach, it looks like he's like screaming out a chorus or whatever. And it looks like they're in a band together. Do you know the photo I'm talking <laughs> no, about? I need I'll to have to bring. It. People have to look it up at home. It's it's you know it's when Lee Harvey Oswald's being ex ex um, escorted from like the jailhouse to to the courthouse, and Jack mm-hmm. Ruby comes in there, and then that's where a lot of these conspiratorial theories get come from. That Oswald was shot by. Um, Jack Ruby to cover up some sort of mob connection or something like that. I don't know. I don't care about any of that. But, um, uh, yeah, so that's what I understood to be the rapidly unfolding moment. Okay, so it's something in... Can you think of another example? Like I can think of maybe... Maybe, like, I thought of, like, a... Tiananmen Square. I can yeah, think of that yeah. That picture the, the person, you know, standing in front of the tank. Yeah, yeah, of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, the the... the, the uh, the dissident who's like raising his fist in front of the tank or like yeah. when Muhammad Ali has just vanquished, is it uh Frazier or something like that? I'm not sure. He's like standing over him or mm-hmm. something like that. Instances like that. Um, the third one was super interesting. The surprise of prowess. And that was the, mm-hmm. int- that was uh, like someone who just like devotes their entire life to perfecting one subject. And this is the instance of the person who just kept photographing the exploding milk droplet. Yeah. It reminded me <laughs> of uh, John Malkovich's character in art school confidential, where he's like, I spent my whole life doing triangles. <laughs> like, like that's your, like that's the summation of your entire artistic work. Yeah. So that's the third way. Like you just kind of get increasingly better at that. The fourth does that is that one cool or do oh, you, that's you, fine. Do you think of no, another I, example? I, no, I, don't I think know. that's a great. I think bringing in Art School Confidential is, is that's a great, great movie. That's a great distinction. What's the What's the next? The one? next one is like contorting technique, messing with the camera, getting sure. it to like blur out and give us like psych, you know, psych, a psychedelic, blurry sort of view or whatever, so it can give us sort of something unexpected mm. than pure mimetic form, right? Which is interesting. I mean, interesting to me because that almost kind of mimics painting, at least. Yeah, yeah. It's trying to get a painting. Trying to be kind of like a watercolor or yeah, wash. Yeah, and then the and or or nothing really at all. Trying to obscure the idea that there's a referent altogether. That it's just like just like maybe the picture comes out like a underdeveloped and looks like a Rothko painting or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Trying to be painting. Yeah, and then and then the last one was just kind of the right place, right time. uh, in I, I I thought this was kind of like uh, something that gives us sort of this um this feeling that, that we go on a scavenger hunt or something like that. For instance, like I used like I uh, I used to go around and and take photos of people and like sometimes they would do things spontaneously on the camera that like I couldn't anticipate. Mm-hmm. Uh, what would be another? I mean, I mean maybe it's I mean, odd because like the action one, like the action examples that we gave might be good examples as well because you think of right place right time that that photographer was in the right place to, to see jack ruby shoot yeah i guess i guess i guess it depends on like what yeah i guess what the, yeah that person was in the right place right time i guess what the difference is with this like like with the nuns with the with the paint with the uh, photograph of the soldiers and the nuns um you got the soldiers in the foreground and the, and the nuns in the background like that's not re- I guess the I guess the key word there is rapidly unfolding. Okay. Yeah, so maybe in this maybe in that scenario, I mean, maybe the nuns are coming in and out of that town, mm-hmm. that war tour town all the time and the photographer just happened to be in the right place right time to to capture that particular aspect of daily life. Or like, I don't know, if you're just like if the photographer is like you know, taking pictures of like indigenous people in the Amazon rainforest and they do something that I don't know, they do all the time or it takes a long process or something like that. Maybe that would be an example. I think right, that's right. Yeah, right. Maybe that would be the way. To, so, so, the, but he says all these five different surprises have one thing in common and that, that they, they totally just defy any sort of rules for what we think good photography is. Or but what an the interesting distinction, photo is. which is really fascinating. Maybe we can go into detail is that this isn't punctum. None of these things are punctum. Well, Which is, that's what he, that's what he said. In you the think video. he says that? I'm pretty sure he says none of these are punctum. I just want to you let think. You know. Do you think you think he you think he says that a surprising photo can't have the duality of studium and punctum in it? Because like if I went back over these, right? Mm-hmm. If I like if I use the so if I looked at the the photo of of the all right so the rarity right mm-hmm. like the bearded lady the two headed boy the circus freak photos. Is that all studium? There's no punctum in that? I think we should footnote this conversation yeah. because he's going to bring up 
the nature of punctum later. Yeah. And I think that might be able to help us understand whether these things are, in fact, Cause examples I, of punctum. Because well, I, I think this is going to be a critique for Bart throughout, and I'll, I'll bring it up here. I think the thing is, is that the punctum is going to be radical. Whether or not one can identify a punctum is going to be radically de- contingent upon who's viewing the photograph. Like, it... it and there might be more than one punctum in the thing. I'm getting ahead of myself, but they, they, yeah. So, um, I, I, I think, yeah, that was the thing I was going to ask you, right? Is like, you know, is everything surprising, is surprising just shock, right? Mm-hmm. Is it just like grotesque, like, whoa, or does it, does it actually have that sustaining duality of studium and punctum in right. it? I mean, what, what are your, what, I mean, what's your preliminary thought on it? Preliminary thought. I think what's really interesting, at least for Barth, is that he describes punctum, and it's in in the Latin word as a wound. Mm. It's not so much ah ah. It's not it's not just a shock like that. It's more just a piercing sort of thing that just stays with you throughout and makes you makes you think. So I I believe that. We're going to find that surprise is maybe just a surface level sort of shock and that it perhaps is not what punctum is, which is this wound of sorts. I mean, I think it's it's worth just trying to find out more about the nature of punctum, at least in regards to Barth's um, definition and his yeah. exploration in it. All right. Well, let's footnote that and we'll, and we'll come back to it. Um all right, so the next thing that Barth is going to talk about in chapter 15 is, like, he's going to reiterate this claim that a photograph cannot ha- s- engage in s- uh, signification or uh, so it can be some sort of language that we all sort of understand. Mm-hmm. Unless in a very unique scenario where an individual's image becomes a mask, mm-hmm. right? And what, what does he mean by uh, an individual's image becoming mask? When, I ha- when there's this particular photo, what does it mean for it to become a mask? I mean, you think you, I, I think you would have to use the distinction at least in theater, right? Yeah, yeah. I and mean, you did that earlier, correct? Sort of, yeah. I mean, I didn't really go, I didn't really elaborate on it, but there are certain no. things that the photos that become emblematic of an age have, and I've guess, I guess I've kind of given it away, mm-hmm. is that what a, a photo can become a mask if it's seen to be iconic of a certain sort of political or ethical situation that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. And he uses the example of, um, I I guess, Avedon or Avedon. I don't know the photographer's name, but Avedon's born a slave. And it's a really, it's in the book. I really, you guys should really get this book because it has some great photographs in it. Like that this come like that particular photo comes to rep because you see all the lines and the hard work and the abuse that have been that's been bestowed upon this man for no reason besides him being black. And um, you can see the sort of torture, uh, torturous and, and, and onerous existence he's had to live just for something totally arbitrary. And it becomes politically representative. Um, that's how I understand what he says about a mass. Do you want to elaborate on that? Or do you, no, th- do you I think, think I got that right? I think, I think that's a really good explanation. I think what's interesting is that not all photos can be masks, or at least he says that sometimes being a mask is, is very much based on whoever's perceiving it as well, that if they are a cultured person, or at least if they understand these distinctions that they can just get what you maybe saw they say okay born a slave and they looked at the guy and say oh look that's all the hardship from working on the plantation and all the abuse that he had to go through and all this la yada yada but if somebody else was looking at it maybe they wouldn't get the same i guess this goes back to subjective experience yeah well which this, i'm interested well, about where it does like are all masks the same or do some people look at a mask and they say that's not a mask that's just what the person is well and this is the interesting thing is that 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 it's that he says that mass photographs that become mass, right? Mm -hmm. They become mass because we sort of attach some sort of significance to them, right? It's kind of out of the person being photographed's control, right? I don't know. I mean, can we think of a more um, contemporary example? I I don't know. Maybe of uh, like like someone who's been turned into a mask, like someone whose, whose image um, says, says a lot. I mean, Donald Trump, I, sure, there's. I mean, Donald Trump is. The thing is, I mean, they're different. Donald Trump has different masks, right? I mean, nearly any sort of po- politician has turned has their image sort of otherized and turned into a mask. 
Um, and this I, is a very modern thing too, which is very fascinating as well. I wonder. See, those the thing is with the political ones is that they're they're so divergent. Um, I wonder if there's like something that can be universally agreed upon. Maybe like the um, like the soldiers at Iwo Jima, like when they're raising the, the flag there or something like that. Like everybody mm-hmm. kind of has. I think everybody sort of views that similarly. I or. I mean, they're pro- they're probably and maybe others. maybe this is maybe this is this is the interesting part that we have to kind of realize is that not every photograph has a universal that oh everybody thinks this about said photograph. Yeah, I mean that's that's that's, a, that's the problem that Barth keeps running into. He's trying to get at this this science of the photograph, this ontological sort of quintessence of the thing, mm-hmm. and um, he keeps it kind of it keeps coming down to subjectivity in a lot of these ways. Sure, but maybe it's maybe it's um. That one term that you brought up one time uh, was it inter, inter intersubjective objective? Yeah, maybe it's maybe there, maybe there is some kind of intersubjective objectivity that Barth is is. I think that's what he's trying to get yeah, at in yeah. this book is that even though we all have different perceptions of the photograph, that these things do happen when you experience it, and that these things are part of the experience of both witnessing a photograph and of taking a photograph. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, what well, I think it was, I agree with that whole inner subjective objective thing. Cause he says that the, the photos that get turned into mass, that they, that they are unsettling. Right. And in what way are they unsettling? Right. Cause they're, they're, they're communicating this political idea. But it's it's it frustrates the people that know about this political idea because they know that it really is already it's it's preaching to the choir. So like the people that are looking at the at Avedon's born a slave like are already sympathetic to civil rights causes, abolition, mm. you know, further sort of ideas that involve social justice for for oppressed people. But if the but the problem they they think that that because the the. The photo as mask is not screaming so much to be like, look at me, look at me. I'm a political statement that it, 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 it doesn't really communicate to the people who aren't cultured enough, sophisticated enough or free from their prejudices to see what that mask actually is. You understand, so you understand no, no, that makes sense. And I think that, that gets to Bart's ultimate statement that photographs, for the most part, besides you know the Avedon examples and all these other examples can't be political in of themselves that they cannot just spur social change by themselves that there is this meaning that we put onto them that doesn't just come exclusively from the photograph alone but it comes from this kind of idea of already exist already existing modes of thought and whatnot, which I think is like the punctum, right? I mean, that's almost, I mean, without the punctum, I'm sorry, without the studium, it's the studium where, I mean, that's all the kind of social mores and things that we take for granted, or at least that we're. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we take it kind of for granted, but I mean, the thing is, the thing is he'll say that in one out of one side of his mouth, right? He'll say, he'll say like, He'll say that it can't be politically effective, and it's ultimately politically impotent. But yeah. he'll say that. But on the other side of his mouth, regimes do what to these photographs? Oh, sure. I mean, they say no, we can't have them. I mean, it's almost as if the photographs are dangerous right. by censorship. That so they they're going to go. And, yeah, the Nazis would go and sent, anytime there was a like a, an opportunity for. A, a photo, if a photograph got out there to sort of portray Nazi leadership as like as like buffoonery, mm-hmm. right? Or to p- portray an op- someone oppressed within that society as maybe heroic or dignified at the very least, like a, 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 someone who was homosexual or Jewish or or Romanian or whatever or handicapped um, as having dignity and not fitting into their eugenics program. If they could sort of detect the faintest sort of air of political statement in it, they would censor it. So how does that square with what Barth is saying about the political ineffectivity or ineffectiveness? That's what I was going to ask. Uh, yeah, you. I don't. I don't because under- I mean, I yeah. Think, how do you I, reconcile the two? Or maybe, or maybe it does kind of play into what he's saying because perhaps with that knowledge that we can, that with the right knowledge we can take a photograph and make it political that. 
perhaps photographs have a potential to become. Maybe it's more of a potential energy than an actual energy. I mean, if of, of politics, and that maybe censorship, at least in re- in regards to regimes and bigger political powers, might be in a sense trying to stop any kind of potential transformation of a image into a mask. Be that for some kind of uprising or revolution. Maybe, perhaps. maybe the political message of a mask can be subtle, but at the same time, maybe it's like a slow. Maybe like if you have enough of these masks out there, and they sort of, maybe they just start gradually sort of wear away at the established narrative and institute a new one. It may not be as swift as people want it to happen. Like you know, there. I think a lot of people who are really engaged are really interested in like revolution and stuff like that they're they always want to figure out how like music can change the world or how art can change the world or this or that maybe it's just like these masks like they they just kind of at a glacial rate sort of change the culture no and i think and, I and, think and maybe true. and maybe the people in control understand that but then i don't know it almost seems like you give them more power to them when you censor them you know like you kind of make them something that has to be seen or, or taken or done because if you legitimate the power that they have like you're kind of encouraging people to make more of it mm-hmm, which so, is the which is the fascinating part yeah. about that kind of dichotomy I think yeah yeah all right so um, moving on to, to chapter 17 uh, you know I thought this was kind of interesting um, you know we're always up in the clouds but we don't get to talk about the the bodily as much um not that it i, I don't know it's just kind of super strange it's a, it's kind of a, a real curveball here you know barso brings back this conversation of studium and punctum mm-hmm. and he's gonna say that most photos are just composed of studium right uh-huh. and that and that things that are just composed of studium and just as a refresher the studium is that general scene that we have some sort of ethical historical political understanding of and punctum is like you said that wound that thing that jumps out He's going to say that most photos are unary, right? Because uh-huh. they, they're, they're just composed of studium. And he, he thinks most photos are this way. But he says, he throws this in there, he says that pornographic images are unary. Because uh-huh. there's really no room for a punctum. I do, no, punctum it's just sex, 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 it's sex, just sex, a, sex, sex, sex. It's just a stark, yeah. naked body. It's like, it's, it's like... I don't, it's like it's like a sex ed and like taught by your gym teacher. There's nothing interesting about so the it. The fascinating thing is then he makes the distinction that he says erotic art or erotica, on the other hand, is because of what it doesn't show. Because right? of what it doesn't show, and that it has the it has the punctum at least it has somewhere it, it has space for it. I right. Guess, it's almost like by obscuring the pornographic image in or in erotica, you're like trying to like leer behind the photo or something mm-hmm. like that. So you can, and so like this creates some like, like, like that the image is like maybe around the corner or like continued somewhere mm-hmm. else or something like that. I think this really creates an interesting analogy, at least like to spatial, I guess when we talk at spatial, um, I guess it's just just a space in general when we're talking about studio and punctum because it almost sounds like okay some photographs just have all studium there's no space for punctum but that photographs with studium have that little bit of space or it's just even if it's just a little puncture little hole that the punctum can get in I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I find that very fascinating how we're kind of talking about, okay, it's just all sex, all sex, 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 sex. But when you cover it or when you maybe like poke a hole in it, that when when you do that, there is space for some kind of wound or interesting experience to happen. You know, there are so many people who are listening to this that might want me to make the obvious joke here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you really set me up, but I won't do that. Thank you. I'll let them make the joke in their head. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> You're really good at setting me up. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> I, I I don't even know I am. That those are always the best ones. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> Ooh, flashlight. Scary. All right. Oh, I can't read my notes. Awesome. It got dark out here. Um. Let's see. What What else did I want to say? Um. 
uh, I mean, also the thing is with pornography and stuff like that, you can't re- like he's going to say that you can't really go in advance and arrange this duality of punctum and studium or whatever. No. Like, it's this punctum is something that's going to be sort of happens by accident or coincidence, which but goes then, into the yeah, next. But I wanted yeah. to ask you about that. Um, I, I wanted to ask you though, do you think that's true? Do what? you think that's true that you can't arrange like a really intriguing photograph that has both studium and punctum in it? Like if I really thought about it, I was like, mm-hmm. you know what, what, what would be really cool is if, well, if I, if I, if I got this like girl to wield a chainsaw, but mm-hmm. then like, like maybe there's, I can put like a, a cage, I can let a rabbit run across the, the, the scene, like the sure. exact time. Like, could That's... I create, can I create an interesting thing if I stage it like that? I think Barthes has an answer in the next chapter or two. I, I, or, maybe yeah, I don't know. I, I do, I'm gonna let you elaborate because I believe. I mean, I yeah. Why don't you just say? Why don't you do it right now? I believe he says that this the punctum is an accidental sort of thing. That it it isn't so much created by the photographer, but it's just a proof that the photographer was there. Right. That's the interesting part. So I, he really emphasizes the the chance part of the punctum that. It's something that necessarily can't be prepared. It's just this kind of surprise. I don't want to use the word surprise. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, it is. It's, or uh, it, we notice it after the fact. Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, can 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 a skilled photographer just not like like I mean, can, could they not just stage something that would animate us just the same? I mean, how would we know? I mean, isn't isn't it like the analogy he makes to he says, okay, the nuns with the nuns randomly in that photograph with the soldiers that creates punctum. But he says, I don't feel the same way when I see a nun posing with prostitutes. No, that's heavy-handed. Right. So even. Even if it was something more subtle, but still just saying, hey, look at this juxtaposition, isn't it funny? Or, oh, look, isn't this really shocking? I think that kind of artificiality that comes from trying to arrange the punctum, like grasping it, you lose it, I think. When you try to grasp for it, it's not there. But when you just let it happen, it comes. I, I mean, Perhaps I agree, but I just, I kind of feel like it might be possible if I really tried. I'm like, but I also but think. But maybe you can't try. Maybe that's the thing where you say, I also thought I could proof. win a Grammy. <laughs> well, yeah. well, I, mean, I think yeah. that's the distinction I think that he makes, which is very fascinating. And I'll say it again, is that the punctum is only proof of the photographer being there. It's not so much a product of his own invention. That is just presence. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I mean, it'd be very difficult. I, I can't think of any image in advertising or anything like that's ever been done. And I think that's the thing, too, is that it's something that you can't think about. It just happens. Yeah. You can't really fabricate it, as well, I think Barthes will say, is that it just happens. Well, I have this string of questions about the punctum, all right? And, and yeah. we, we, I don't know if we'll be able to answer them all tonight. But I, So I have this little cluster of questions, so let me go ahead and ask them. Is the punctum entirely arbitrary? What, what do you if, think? Well, let me read. Uh, okay. Let me see. What if two people? What if two people see the photo differently and identify different punctums, puncta, whatever you want to say. Puncti. Puncti. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is this a problem for Barth? Wouldn't he have to grant the photos he considers unary to contain puncta he has not discovered? Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe it just takes the right person to see what's sort of buried there in the photograph all along, or, or maybe you look at. Like if we go back to that picture of the, of the nuns and the soldiers or whatever, you look like we can, you and I can both see the nuns, but like, maybe I notice like some, some, in some detail you view insignificant about the soldier's shoelace Mm -hmm. that I, that I'm like, oh my God, he's got like this plant on it. And this plant means that he was here, which means it sets off this sort of string of like historical Mm -hmm. information or whatever. Then I suppose I have to ask you then is that do you think Barthes is saying that there is an objective punctum in a a certain photograph or is that punctum is a trait of photography that we can witness and that anybody can experience punctum 
in different forms in a single photograph. And later on in the lecture, uh, in, in the book, uh, I actually thought that Barth would end up saying that there are going to be different types of punctum, mm -hmm. or, or there are mul multiple puncta. Yeah. Uh, we'll get to it later, not today, tonight. But later on in the book, and hope, maybe we can finish it next time, maybe we won't, I don't know. He'll talk about there being not only these punctum that are in the are, are in the photograph, but there's going to be a tem a, a temporal punctum, hmm. and we'll have to get at what exactly he means by that. So maybe we'll bracket that set of questions and come back to it. No, I think, and I think it's really important too because I think that gets at the heart of how we encounter art in general. Yeah that everybody has a different way of looking at things. I mean, it's something I think that we all know, but I believe the implications are maybe more striking than we think on first glance. And this is, I think, one example, too, is that, okay, so there's the punctum, but everybody experiences a different punctum. So wait, is there any such thing as an unary photograph like you said yeah is there is there such thing as a objective piece of art you know well, what i mean like I, that's I, I, or a piece I, of photography that's sort of after reading this book i don't i, I think batsy, after yeah. reading this book i don't think there will be because you'll mm. yeah and we'll have to revisit a lot of those things but i mean i think this book confuses and complicates the question and and I'll, what's interesting is that it, it's almost like in some ways bart establishes this paradigm for viewing photography but then like it's 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 like a sandcastle he builds and then kicks right before he leads leaves the beach. What do you what do you think of that? Because I think that I think partially you're getting at maybe a point of the work is that he's trying to kind of be vague and he's trying to be confounding in some sense that he's not really concerned with trying to get a systematic approach to how we look at photography or trying to find how beauty can take us to the just state a la Schiller or anything like that. He's, he, it seems like he doesn't really have a set agenda, but he's just kind of exploring. And I'm curious maybe as a philosopher whether that's looked down upon in in thinking fields or whether, I mean, because it seems like... It's unscientific, right? Yeah. Because, like, ultimately it, it is... It isn't... It's, an, it's, it's, it's anti-scientific because it, like... Mm -hmm. Is, is purposely trying to tear up the results that it's worked so hard for. Mm -hmm. um, but Barth isn't interested. I mean, ultimately, Barth is not interested in being a political scientist. He's not really interested in being an empirical scientist. I think all that he's really interested in doing is to make the viewing of art more engaging. I think, all, I think his only agenda, really, is that... Theorizing about photography in this way, when we go into a photo exhibit or we look over old photos or we look through things on our iPhone or Facebook or something like that, we just have an enriched experience. And if it, it doesn't matter, I don't know if it really matters if it's philosophically coherent. So, so long as it animates the mind and makes our lives richer. I think he's only really interested in making our lives richer, so it doesn't really matter if it makes sense. So do you think maybe perhaps... If, I mean, you're saying like he's not really trying to be a scientist, but I mean, he is. He's trying, but he's, well, okay, I mean, with he's, not, he's, he's okay with failing. Yeah, no, I mean, he's trying to be, he's trying to do the science of signs and of, and the messages that they convey, like semi like semiology is what he's doing, or at least, and maybe that's something we can go into further detail. Yeah, I think you might next. be more of authority on that. Oh, no, I mean, I think we both can do a little research, but yeah. I mean, he's dealing with a science, a science of signs, and photography are signs, and he's going into how, how do, how do signs work? How do I look at your shirt and see Nike, and then get the implication of what Nike stands for and what it is? Like, how... It's not so much concerned with the content of what Nike is, but how I got to that conclusion that Nike is a symbol of athletic greatness. Prowess. I, yeah, yeah. If, if, if that makes sense at all. So I think, I think maybe that's what he's getting into too, but I think that science of semiology leads to what you're saying leads well, how do to you a wonder, richer richer how, understanding of, of well how life. do you feel about it i mean i personally am okay with it but like you, i think you're more 
you, it sounds like you want to defend him as, as, as really doing like legitimate scientific research for this. I mean, what do you think? I I'm, I'm okay with him being unscientific, but you seem to be a little bit more concerned with preserving his reputation, his, re, his reputation I'm not so as much a concerned, semiologist. I'm not so much concerned with standing with him, but I'm interested in walking with him or at least knowing where he's going. And I think he is, and he even references this too. I mean, he takes a lot from semiology and there's a work that he did called mythologies that perhaps we can go into yeah. as well, which goes into this, into semi semiology and how, and his own little definition of what myths are. I'm going to have to totally research the heck out of that for next time. No. And I, I think, I think it is, Maybe maybe that goes more towards what semiology is. Maybe it is a very vague sort of science that leads to a lot of kind of, eh, this could work, eh, this couldn't work. But Or maybe it does leave a lot of room for interpretation and freedom of examination and of conclusions. But I, I, all, I'm, all I'm curious about is the tradition that he's working in, which... I think is semiology, but he does take liberties for sure. Though then again, I don't really know what liberties he's taking because I don't know semiology that well. Yeah. Well, let, we'll do some research and we'll come back to that. I mean, I, I, we don't have to have all the answers right now. No. Um, I guess I just wanted to close out with chapters 21 and 22. Okay. Um, uh, I mean, the... Um, He's going to go on a little bit about the, the about try about the punctum and how it really can't be defined. It sort of by its very nature is um, unnameable, unnameable, and can't be explained. And, um, and 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 if it could, you know, if we could say exactly what a punctum was or whatever, um, it wouldn't really set us off on sort of the animating adventure of Advenius. So, with that said. Does that perhaps change your mind that you can create a punctum if it is this unnameable, no, that's an interesting point. undecipherable thing that can anybody fabricate a punctum? Because that would require you conceiving of it in advance. It would if you, that that I think we just answered a question. Naming the unnameable. Yeah, yeah. If if we that. staged a photo and tried to include studium and punctum in it, the punctum would be overdetermined and therefore not interesting. And therefore, would not set our mind off on an inconvenience. Mm-hmm. Did he say that, or did you come up with that, or how, what? Did Did he say that, or did you come up with that just now, um, on the spot? Um, I guess we both did. No, it's all you, man. Barth, that's that's Barth, a tremendous. Barts and I kind of talked a little bit before. <laughs> well, that's that, that's a that's a tremendous insight. Way way to think on your feet, because I it was totally I totally admit. No, that. I think that I think that was what I was trying. I guess when we were having that discussion, you know, a couple you, minutes ago, I think that's what I was trying to stress is that you can't really like. I mean, Bart says that you can't really get the. Punk I know, but I couldn't like, explain. Oh, I couldn't. I couldn't understand yeah. why. But I think we just figured yeah, out why. Yeah. 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 Uh, and the last little thing that I want to want to talk about here is, um, and I thought this was really great, uh, and I don't even have to look at my notes anymore. How does he say that? How does he say that we? How does he tell us? Uh, how do how do we know when we have an incredible photo on our hands? What does he say that we ought to do? How do? We, what's the test to know? That if we really have something that is really wonderful, that it does have that duality of of studium and punctum in it, is it is it maybe how we can? I mean, how we're describing even the photographs that we're describing right now is that we don't have to look at them necessarily. Yeah, I, we I'm can. Saying, set, yeah, we can, we can, we can we, just kind of have it in our minds and say yes. It, it, that's for, the photograph, and we can take an essence of it. I think, or we can have some kind of thing that sticks out like the Lee Harvey Oswald thing or Tiananmen Square picture. yeah you can't get those images out of your mind no yeah like they are burned into your cerebral cortex they will be forever with you and he he says that's that's how you know you have a good photograph if you if you put it down and you just can't stop thinking about and it I think that's the fascinating thing is that we're all doing that right now we're, we're discussing Tiananmen Square and then the people watching or listening they have an image of Tiananmen Square if they've seen it 
which I'm sure you many have had. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, they or they will now. They, they go look it up. They are seeing it, and that's forever ingrained in their minds. That yeah, I think it is that kind of weird thing where you can just close your eyes and just imagine it. And that's one thing Bart says, even when we were talking about the unary, is that he says, "Well, I, I just forget it." Yeah, I don't, I don't. I don't. I don't recall. I don't the think twenty I mean, photos I've seen in the newspaper, you know, about celebrities or whatever. I don't think pornographic images stick with us either. No, and they don't. And maybe that's a really interesting point as well. Is that when you think of something like you know pornographic images, pornography in general, that it is this kind of just wash over of sexual images, and that you know anybody that encounters it isn't really concerned with. Well, and that's a really interesting thing, too, is that some people focus on a certain pornographic star and kind of say, oh, that's, that's the woman because she's really beautiful. Is that is that almost a, achieving a sort of punctum? If there is some part of that woman that men find or men or, or I, man or male that women find attractive that does that maybe bridge the gap between pornographic and erotic imagery i don't know i mean i've never f- I, 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 <laughs> I never I, I, really I, thought I, of it either until I, I, now yeah, no, but I, I can't i can't say i've it's been a i can't say I've ever, yeah. yeah it's been a long time well no no, I, no but seriously i i, no, I, I understand I, I, but, I, I don't i'm not i don't think there's i don't have any problem talking about this i just can't say that i fell in i don't i can't say i fell in love with a body sure. or, or just couldn't get a body out of your I, I, mind. Yeah, but I'm a strange dude. Like I'm just, I'm 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 doing a lot of philosophy. I don't know no, if there's much. But left I think over I think that's think an bodies. interesting point too. And maybe by analogy, if we talk about romantic love, that there are maybe there is a punctum in there another definitely, person that you know, even though defi- we do have sexual relations with that person, that there is a certain kind of thing that connects us with that person that we can't really describe i mean i can't i can't when you're in love and you try to say like okay why do you like this person sometimes you just don't know what to say no or you get very superficial answers and you say well there's something well i'll I'll say this there are beautiful faces that i can't get out of my mind but i think can you describe why they're beautiful or is there yeah i think i probably can using using what barth is talking about here i think i've turned them into a mask uh, I think I have. I think okay. those beautiful faces. Ooh. I have attached meaning to them, mm. right? So all the faces that I love, okay. right? To me, I've attached some sort of virtue to them. So that's not necessarily punctum, then, or is it? I'm trying to remember if, uh, if, if even he, well, Bart we said we, that whether the yeah, mask is punctum or not, because it is. Well, he did. He said the born a slave. I mean, I mean. Definitely had punked them all in it. I, okay, so maybe but, maybe that's just part of it, part of the photograph. But I, I think you have to say that the 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 thing that makes that face so memorable, you have to say that it, there is a physical manifestation on that face, right? Mm-hmm. So like, so like, I'll confess this. Like, <laughs> I I I think like for, so I think um, one of my favorite features in a woman are are eyes. Okay. I, I, that is to me, eyes are the most beautiful feature that a woman can have. And I don't know, man, eyes to me, like I associate all these things with eyes. Sure, like, with they're like the soul. They're, yeah. Like they're these. portals to other dimensions. Yeah. They're, they're like these, 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 um, wormholes to truth. So then would that be the studium then? Is that, that, that's kind of, the, I think those would be the, the punctum. Oh, the I, th- punctum. I okay. think those would be the punctum. And then the studium would sort of be hair and everything else, you know? Uh, okay. But there can be this special sort of thing. Yeah. But it's so interesting though, because eyes. it's like, <laughs> no, but it's so interesting though, is that within that punctum, there are already cultural mores that we already understand or like, you know, a window to the soul portals. Like we've read that. We have understood that, you know, via literature. It's a different thing to see. It's a different thing to see it in person. Sure, and maybe that's the distinction too: is that there is that the studium can only tell us so much, but or maybe that the studium and the punctum can tell us the same thing, if this makes any sense. But the punctum is that unnameable thing that we can't really like, like the eyes, or maybe if you say like, "Oh, look at the features of the eyes; they are symmetric." And everything is proportioned in such a way. Look at her iris and look at the color blue of her eyes. That Maybe that's all studium, but the punctum is that certain trait of her eyes that we 
can't really describe. We can't really describe empirically or aesthetically. It's just there. Mm. And maybe this is something that's really cool is that we, we, we're describing photographs, but we're describing people. We could describe things that just aren't photographs in general. Maybe we can describe... Well, just, Anything with studium and punctum, I think this is really cool. I just so think I, just I think of... it's so wonderful that our our, our minds function as cameras that that, yeah. like, like, that we can that we can ascend. Like I, there's a of Montreal song and there's a lyric in there where um, I don't need a photograph because you never left my mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, something. Oh, like that, that that goes yeah. straight into Bart's final, at least the final thought we're leaving with Bart's in this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah. podcasts, is that yeah, you just you just can never get it out of your mind. It's always there. That's... I, I, you know, I could, I could go on about that, but we're at the hour mark, so we should stop. And That's we should, fine. Go, we should go play some music. Sure. We should play some good music. Well, I'll, I'll continue that thought in the basement. Got some thoughts about that. All right. Thanks, guys. See you next week. <laughs>